Um, all right, so my name is Karen Ganey, and um, I, I guess I've been involved in the community garden for a number of years, and was a caretaker one year, and have seen it grow and evolve, and I think it's just one of the most valuable community resources we have, because we're able to come together like this, as a group. And while I'm here to give the presentation, I'm sure we all have uh, knowledge to share. Yes. And um, so we can uh, do that together, because there's so much information that's out there that um, sometimes it can just be so overwhelming. So, um, and so let's see, I'm a gardener, farmer, teacher, and after school program, inspired permaculturist. Um, and I love talking about plants and how they work together in communities. And that's kind of the focus of the topic today, is how we can intentionalize our groupings of plants to maximize both the health of the plants, uh, the health of the soil, and therefore the health of ourselves. So uh, I'm going to do some talking, and I don't have like all the perfect combinations memorized, but I have a couple of things that I'm just going to highlight. And then there's um, I have this handout that this place called Golden Harvest put out, and it's really comprehensive. It has uh, it includes some uh, information on perennials and annuals and mixing them. And we're going to leave it here in the resource guide. And also maybe Chris might make photocopies and leave them up at the Upper Valley Food Co-op if you want your own, um, you know, for your guides, for your school gardens or wherever. Um, so before getting into the specifics of companion planting, I like to talk a little bit about um, what are the considerations are um, and for informing our decisions. And one of the reasons why I got into permaculture and got my certificate and is because I was looking for a framework to use to help guide my decision-making process. Because as some of you probably know already, it's like, how do we choose what to plant with what. I mean, a lot of our taste preferences can guide our gardening practice, which is nice. Um, but what else? And, um, you know, just getting overwhelmed with like, what do we do? And can we mix perennials and annuals? And how do we know which go, which go well together? Um, so permaculture kind of provides that framework. And that in the framework is based on many, many things. One being um, maximizing the relationships. And so, and it was really built on this foundational piece that everything is truly interconnected. So I just love starting with that because it's good to remind ourselves that every action that we take has um, you know, an impact on other things um, around it. So, um, so consideration is the connection and then just, again, um, maximizing or just being aware of the relationships between and among things. And when we're looking at those relationships, we're able to inform our process of design um, because there are things that happen within those relationships that uh, are symbiotic. <coughs> oh, um, that's what? Or, um, you know, and a really good example of that is the symbiotic relationship between bacteria and like nitrogen fixing plants like legumes. We know that that bacteria helps to kind of fix the nitrogen. It brings it out from the air into the soil. Um, and the bacteria lives on the, the roots of some of those plants and it also feeds the plants. So it's kind of like a win-win-win situation. And there could probably be like two more wins in there if we like kind of picked it apart. Um, so other considerations for um, thinking about com you know, combining plants and putting them together in different ways is um, what I like to think about is what happens both underneath the soil and above the soil. And there's lots of different ways that things can be combined um, to bring nutrients to the soil um, and bring microbes and the things need more, like tomatoes need a lot of nitrogen, as does corn. So it's nice to think about what we can plant there that meets that need. Um, and as much as we can identify our own selves as being stewards within a community, then we're able to say, okay, well, do I want to be, you know, going with my fertilizer and putting it on the plant, you know, every couple of weeks? Or can I put something there that's providing it and also feeding it and working with itself? So, um, 
So one of the so I think one of the reasons that I also love gardening is because I get we get to work with this amazing, incredible, living resource that we are all connected to and dependent on, which is the soil life. And um, and we can see over time that when we plant certain things, we can uh, really intentionalize increasing the life around the um, rhizomial uh, area of the root system. Um, and we'll see this in most plants that are referred to as what's called uh, dynamic accumulators or mineral accumulators. And these are most things that have longer tap roots that are able to, <clears throat> in their long tap root, draw up some of the minerals in the subsurface layers of the soil to the surface and make those things accessible to the other plants. So, um, so it's good to observe as we're gardening, is this a shallow rooted plant or is this a deep rooted plant? And generally speaking, most things that are deep rooted are, are, are pulling those um, nutrients and minerals to the surface layer. Um, an example of that is squash, has the shallow roots. Um, and something that it might like to be planted next to is like a borage. And borage has a longer kind of root system. And I'm going to talk a little bit about borage because it's one of my favorite companion plants. And it's often forgotten about and it's an old cottage herb and there's just so many amazing uses for it. And it's easy to grow from seed and it self-seeds over time. Um, so, so we're thinking both under what's happening underneath the soil, how much space does each plant need? Um, and oftentimes uh, they need less than we think they need if they're put together in the right combinations. Um, we're thinking about organic matter because uh, organic matter provides um, the medium for plants to uptake nutrients. If there's not enough organic matter in the soil, the plant won't be able to take up the nutrients that it needs. Um, and organic matter is just what it says that it is, which is any life that mostly with chlorophyll that is decomposing. And in the process of decompo decomposition, it's um, adding soil structure. So not only is it enabling plants to take up minerals, it's also um, providing a medium that helps retain water. So if you have a soil that doesn't have enough organic matter, the water is probably running through it. Um, and sometimes when that happens, the plant is unable to take up the water or the nutrients. Um, so soil life, um, organic matter, thinking about roots, the lengths, um, the spread of the roots. Sometimes things are very, you know, you'll see roots that start to spread a lot. Um, and then, so that's below, and then we also, an another one of our considerations is above the soil. And then as we're thinking about combining things, the considerations for that are, for instance, we have like lettuce, which is a broad leaf, and actually left to its own devices would be a beautiful, beautiful mulch because it's shading the ground, which is helping the soil to retain moisture um, and it's uh, suppressing weeds. And so something that might be planted well or next to um, the lettuce is the carrot, which is kind of a frilly, long leaf that can't necessarily outcompete the weeds that'll grow around it. Um, the lettuce has a shallow uh, root system, whereas of course the carrot is a longer root system. So there's a lot of companion planting that we can do just by thinking of what is the structure of the plant. Um, and is it a broad leaf or is it a narrow leaf? Um, and then the other considerations, that's the second one. And then the third consideration is um, what kinds of things do we want to be attracting to our gardens? And there's so many different um, <coughs> bugs and insects out there, some of which are eating our plants and some of which like to eat the bugs. So there's basically two categories of these being the predatory insects, and those are gonna be the, the insects that are eating the bugs that are eating the plants. <coughs> and then there's gonna be the beneficial pollinators, which are being drawn to things that are aromatic, um, that have nectar, and then that those things are gonna be helping to pollinate our garden. Um, and so just generally speaking, those are the two categories um, of, of insects. And I still find, I'm like, is this a good bug or a bad bug? And there's no such thing as good or bad, essentially, but um, one of the ways that I've 
helped train myself to think about it is that like, um, like aphids eat our plants, but they're also, they're just food for ladybugs. So we have to think about how we're responding to infestations of whatever. So if we have aphids on our plants, a lot of conventional gardening has kind of led us to this idea of, oh, I have to spray something. I'm gonna kill those bugs because they're eating my plant. It's a natural response, like don't eat my food or I'm gonna eat a... So, but there are other ways of working with the, the, the interconnection of things by way of bringing insects that are gonna eat the aphids. Um, so those would be the ladybugs. Another really beneficial insect that eats as a predatory one are the lacewings. Um, and those will eat a number of different small bugs that eat leaves. Um, and hoverflies are also really great for eating small bugs. Um, and I've, I actually have a whole list here, and this is one of the most incredible resources, and I have the website that I found it on, but it's basically what's the predatory insect and what plant draws it. And so what I've done is I've kind of synthesized some of the best plants that have multiple functions. So we want to be planting something, and this is another principle of permaculture, is we do what's called stacking functions. So any one thing that we do has many reasons behind it. So if I'm planting, for instance, like a, a chamomile, I brought some today because it's a wonderful beneficial um, plant that brings the beneficial insects and the predatory wasps, but it's also a dynamic accumulator. It's also a medicinal, it's also beautiful. So just right off the top of my head, there's like four reasons why I would plant that one plant. Um, there's a lot of plants that are like that, um, you know, that will go in into um, any questions so far about any of that? Oh. Just saying one thing, my favorite plant is a uh, fava bean because you're talking about how, uh, you know, having aphids will bring in um, ladybugs. ladybugs, but the, the fava bean, it just attracts aphids like you wouldn't believe. And I think it's evolved to be hardy enough to, to take it. So you'll get, the fava, you'll, you'll get like this kind of black top where you get all, all these, um, aphids, but then it brings in so many other insects because they have a food source now, so right. it's kind of a cool thing. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, that's awesome because you're like, oh, okay, it's no longer just a pest, but it's bringing other things. And diversity builds the health of any system, whether it's a human system or, you know, natural system in our guts and the forest and our gardens all around. So, yeah. And you, did you learn that just by way of watching? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. just planted it and then I, yeah. then I when I first saw it, I was concerned. Yeah. Then I looked it up online and figured out, like, why am I five of beans covered in aphids? And, yeah. That's and great. Um, they grew they grew up taller and then they went away and yeah. the aphids went away, but the plants are still fine. And, that's wonderful. They're just watching. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's actually how I've learned most of my th Like, I go online, I look in books. So, like, this time of year, I open a book and I'm like, <laughs> and but then you're in the garden, you're like, oh, wow, look at that. Like, you can see what's right there. It's so helpful. Um, okay, so where else? So thinking about companion planting, like in our garden, we can use a lot of annuals, but a community of plants is referred to as um, what's called a guild. Um, or guild. G-Y-L-D. G -G yep, like an artist guild. Okay. Or, yep. So which is basically, it's just short for plant community or community. But when we're in corp we're intentionalizing a guild, we're thinking about a plant community. Um, so how these things are put together, or also you'll hear polyculture, you know, and this actually you can look at any like even just this little grass around us. It's almost a polyculture like I can see one, two, three, four, five different species of things. Um, so it's a little bit more than a monocrop. So and I so I like thinking about those things and um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about like perennial plantings. Um, that work well together, and then we can talk about the annual garden plantings. Um, so for instance, when we plant fruit trees, you know, oftentimes we're used to singing kind of like orchards where there's just trees. Um, but one of the best ways to ensure health and longevity to your tree is by planting a guild around the base of the tree. Um, and so things that would restore nutrients, bring the nutrients to the surface level, draw the pollinators, um, you know, to pollinate and then, um, you know, and to mulch the soil. There's so many things. So one really good um, plant for most tree guilds are um, garlic chives. 
they're, well, all onions and alliums are restorative to the soil, which means that they're helping to clean out pathogens. And, um, you know, the more that I've been a gardener and also just kind of equally interested in my own health, I recognize that there's a many things that have a benefit to the soil and a benefit to my body. For instance, you know, garlic. Like if I feel like I'm gonna get getting sick, I eat some garlic. It's the same kind of thing with the soil. Like we can plant chives, you know, around the base of those plants, um, or trees, I'm sorry, and they will um, bring beneficials and also they deter um, apple scab. So, um, so any, so which is kind of neat. So, and chives I recommend because you can get multiple harvests every year from a chive plant. Um, the bees love it. Um, the flowers are decorative, uh, like it prevents the apple scab. You know, there's just a couple reasons. You could even look up and probably find some more too. It's a really wonderful one. Um, another one, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of a list now, I guess. Um, alfalfa is nice. It's used in conventional growing for like broad spectrum cover cropping, but it can also be used in small amounts, like um, at the ends of your beds or in between your rows or around your trees. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. Um, it's a pollinating plant. And when it's done, or if you're ready to, like in the early spring, you can seed it and you can always turn it in if you have time um, and to give it a little bit of time to decompose and add some organic matter and then plant into your bed. Um, it accumulates uh, micro and macronutrients, nitrogen, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium. So these are a lot of things that you would find in Mixes like, for instance, ProGrow. I don't know if you guys are using ProGrow. It's a really wonderful North Country Organics product. And it has a slow release kind of green sand um, and both macro and micronutrients. But we can also do that with the alfalfa. Buckwheat is another cover crop that can also be used. And it's a self-seeding. Um, and you can turn it in if you're done with it, or you can let it go um, to seed. Um, that attracts the hoverflies and the predatory wasps, which are going to be eating the, the smaller aphid type family bugs, um, which is awesome. Um, I've already talked a little bit about borage, which is one of those dynamic accumulators, so it brings like um, all kinds of things, including vitamin C, calcium, potassium, and uh, mineral salts. And let's see. So it's also said, and I haven't noticed this, I mean, it must be on a really subtle level, but um, to increase the flavor of different things, especially strawberries. So you, know, you gotta try that out and try to do a little um, you know, plot where you don't put borage next to your strawberries and then the plot where you do and see if you can notice the taste difference. Um, and it also brings a lot of bees and the uh, beneficial predatory wasps. Um, carrots are already are good companions with I've already mentioned lettuce um, but also onions and tomatoes um, and the carrot would benefit the tomato but the tomato doesn't necessarily benefit the carrot because the sh they might shade it out and make it smaller carrots but it's said to increase the flavor um, so that's some um, Oftentimes I get a lot of questions at the garden center about um, Japanese beetles and they really like roses. Um, so one of the, um, a plant that will help to deter the Japanese beetle is sometimes, and what I'm also learning the more that I get into this is like the, arom the more the aromatic of the plant, the stronger it's um, benefit. So um, catnip or it's called nepeta is a big, beautiful silvery leaf, purpley flower and um, it deters the Japanese beetle. So it's a nice thing to put next to some roses or other things that might have the beetles. Oh, awesome. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, cool, good to know. Yarrow, thank you. Yep, and it's a dynamic accumulator. Um, so yes, and it also, um, catnip also drives away the flea beetles. And those are the little ones, and I don't know, I mean, raise your hand if you don't know any, of the, I mean, aphids are like the tiny, tiny little white ones that the ladybugs eat. Flea beetles are little black beetles, and they'll leave like tiny little holes in your leaves, and they jump. 
So you'll like, you know, you can, when you, if you shake your plant, you'll see all these little black bugs coming up. Um, what else? Uh, oh, chamomile. German chamomile is said to be an annual. However, I've seen it perennialize here, no problem. Or self seed, I should say. Um, and it's a good one for cabbages and cucumbers. Um, it brings wasps and hoverflies. And it also accumulates a lot of nutrients. Um, it's said to increase oil production of herbs. So if you're if you're growing herbs for kind of volatile oils or for medicinals, um, it's a good idea to plant chamomile or have your herb garden with some chamomile um, around it. Um, yeah, the chives. Chives is another good one for the Japanese beetle. Um, another incredible um, plant is the dill. And one way that's kind of nice to think about some of this is a lot of the umbelliferous plants, which is like the yarrows, um, dill, you know, it grows up and it puts out that like beautiful kind of big broad flower, are, are all bringing beneficial insects. So, and dill also deters the cabbage worm which are like those fat little worms <laughs> that eat through the leaves and then they become the moths. And oftentimes they'll be in the garden and they'll be like, oh, look at the pretty white butterflies. And you're like, those things are gonna wreak havoc in all their brassicas. So I highly recommend, and it's also beautiful. I always like putting dill in and around cabbage and collards and broccoli. Um, yeah, and which reminds me, the other consideration that we didn't talk about is food combining. So there's another element, like when you're going out, like if you're interested in the food aspect of things, you can do container gardens and just go out and harvest your salad that's full of herbs and greens and leaves. Um, and, and they oftentimes will also taste good together, which I just love. Nature's like an amazing mystery. Um, so yeah, dill and brassicas are really good together. Um, another one that I like to plant, um, like as a on the ends of a lot of beds, is sweet alyssum, and it's um, I think it's two L's or an S, two S's. I'll find it. But um, it's so it's really easy to start from seed, and it's a low-growing flower that has a musky scent. So it's drawing all the beneficials to the garden. And you can put it at the ends of your rows, so you, because you don't want it, it can, it can spread a little bit, but it's an annual, so you don't have to worry about it taking over. Um, but so it provides a uh, living mulch, and it brings the beneficials, and it's also really beautiful. Um, so I highly recommend Alyssa. That's on the top of my list, I would say, like the top five beneficials would be like Alyssa, borage, dill, chamomile. Calendula. So this is an interesting one. So marigolds, everyone always associates the marigolds and the tomatoes. But what I've been learning is there's actually a specific kind of marigold that you need. And um, it is called... Oh yeah. The French marigold. There's two. There's the French marigold and the Mexican marigold. <laughs> fun to learn the history about those. Um, and those are good, and the reason that people plant them around the um, tomatoes is because they kill the um, harmful nematodes. Um, and it repels other insects that would also be like the bean beetle. Is it true that marigolds mosquitoes away? I haven't seen the, this mosquito I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's a specific one. I know it's supposed to, um... It was French and Mexican. Mexican. Yeah, the Petula and the Munuta. Of the, yeah. Um... But you only want to do it with your nightshades or your tomatoes, because it can have a negative effect on beans and cabbage. So... Um, mint is also a nice one. You want to be careful with it because it can spread in your annual garden, but maybe like next to your garden or on a border can be really nice or even a forest edge. I've seen people plant it. We actually just had a property where 
the way that the, the land was all um, sloped, the winds were kind of were bringing in the noceums. So what we did is we um, trimmed back the forest edge. We just pruned to open up more airflow. And we're gonna go in and, and then we sprayed with allium spray. And now we're gonna go in and plant swaths of mint. Um, and that's gonna help um, bring the things that are gonna um, eat the noceums. So it's kind of fun to think about how to do like ecological management of these things. And nothing is necessarily being harmed. There, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be more biomass, which is gonna be able to be utilized. Um, so it's kind of exciting to think about, you know, out of the box when it comes to planting different things. Um, another top on my list is Lovage. It's a perennial. And oh, there's a witch. Oh. Oh, 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 I think oh. it actually it gets into her garden once in a while. Oh, I'm sure it does. She thinks much done. There's a whole, like, ooh, that. There's, yeah. there's a big garden over there, too. I'm sure it's getting well fed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lavender is supposed to repel both fleas and moths. Um, and it also is a nectar feeding plant. So um, anytime we're bringing the nectar to bring the beneficials, that's really good. Do you have any plant that will attract tick eating animals? It's a good question. I, I mean, we need to look into that a little bit more. I, I, I don't know. Does anyone else know? Yeah, I've, I've heard of getting in the chickens. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is like trying to keep balance. So even if there's, I'm sure there's specific things, but as a general rule of thumb, if we can think about diversity and creating balance, then even if there's like a little small infestation of Japanese beetles, the idea is, is that it's not eating more than like a third of the plant, you know, or a third of the area or something. So it's like, like, I am personally okay with a certain number of things because I'd like to see that there's a lot around. It's like a little mini ecosystem. Um, and anytime it, there's, and it's, I mean, balance can be restored sometimes really easily and sometimes it takes years or decades. So, um, you know, we kind of need to shift our, the way that we think about, um, like, invasives or, you know, the way, like, um, we have a, a friend that wrote this book called The War on Bugs, you know, and it's like the incredible harmful effects of the pesticide and the chemical industries on not only our crops, but um, the soil, and it takes a really long time to restore soil life after things have been overly sprayed. So, um, so yeah, we just need to shift the way that we think about all this and say, okay, there's a, a lot of this right now and a little bit of that, like how can we bring a little bit of more of this and then see how it changes. Um, all right, let's see, what else? There's so many things, and I can pass these around. Um, this is, like I said, from Golden Harvest. It's an online resource. There's both annuals and perennials listed. Um, and, love the I talked about marigold. Mints deter the cabbage moths. We got a question about ants the other day. Um, mint, um, ants can be grown, I mean, plant, <laughs> sorry. You grow a lot of ants. Uh, mint, this is a good one. Again, the aromatic stuff is, is really wonderful. Um, and then the other thing is like, I love just talking about like most herbs are bringing, are gonna bring some beneficial. Um, so oregano for instance is really great um, for bringing um, a lot of the pollinators and beneficials, it's also very aromatic. Um, and I highly recommend just putting them right in with your vegetable gardens. Um, that's, that's a good one. And, okay. So then the other way, so those are some of like the general guidelines of planting things to bring the beneficials or the predatories um, and, and intermingle things so that you're suppressing weeds. Um, one of the ancient combinations, you guys have probably heard of Three Sisters Garden. And that's just planting things in the way that they work together. And there's beautiful folklore stories about that. The, um, but the corn provide is a, it has a lot of needs, a lot of nitrogen. Um, the beans are nitrogen fixing, and um, 
Now these are nitrogen fixing and so they feed the corn and the squash is a ground cover so it helps contain the weeds. So there's three things that are all working for and with each other. There's a lot of them. So then the other thing, and I, I actually... Yeah. Um, have you done it before? Like what order do you Oh, for the three sisters? Yeah. yeah, I have. And so basically what you do is... Corn is a you direct seed corn, and you can start curcubits from seed and starts, um, and beans you can seed. So what I would do is establish my corn and let it grow a little bit, and then plant beans around it, water them in, and then put the curcubits, and then transplant the curcubits. And I highly recommend transplanting brassicas, curcubits, lettuce. Um, because like young lettuce, the aphids love it. Oh, also arugula is an incredible catch crop for aphids. And so a catch crop is something that you can plant that brings the bugs so that they don't eat your plants. And also nasturtium. And Hubbard. And what? Hubbard squash. And Hubbard squash. Mm -hmm. Plant Hubbard along with your other squash. They prefer the Hubbard. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so, yes, yeah, so we have a list of like our top, I don't know, we probably round about five or six. Um, and then the other thing, and I might have enough of these handouts. This is from a workshop that we did with this other community initiative where we're planting fruit trees. And on the back side of it, I've list, listed um, the dynamic, some dynamic accumulators, nitrogen fixers, the beneficials for in, um, that would, the predatories and the pollinators and then things that are good medicinally, and also some edible ground covers so to suppress weeds. Um, and we might have enough of those for everyone. And then on the other side, not necessarily pertaining to the workshop today, but it's how to plant a tree. Um, so you can pass those around if you want. Um, because that's the, that's the other, you know, like those considerations about the nitrogen fixing plants and the dynamic accumulating plants. It's good to have, like, there's so much information out there. Sure. And what I, my rule of thumb is just to have like, like top three or five. So every year I make sure these are in my garden. And then, you know, and then I might add like one more per year just to get to know and see what it does and how it, and how it operates or how it grows. Um, and so, yeah. And then, cause we shouldn't have to be scientists um, to be gardeners. But it's nice to be informed by science when we're gardening, so that we are, you know, we're doing intentional plantings. It's fun to be a scientist and a gardener. You can do your own experiments. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's great. Um, I also was just reading as I was preparing for this workshop a little bit about cosmos are really good for the lace wings, the parasitic wasp, and the hoverflies, um, which are going to be eating the other things. Um, tansies are good. Thank you. And Iberus is a perennial, and actually, it's one that it's one of the first plants to produce some um, flowers in the early spring, and it's still blooming now, and it'll bloom through mid June. So, in thinking about drawing the beneficials and creating a diverse, healthy ecosystem, it's nice to think about those early blooming and then mid to late blooming things. So, the, in, within your garden, there's always something to bring the beneficials. Especially now when we're seeing such um, harmful effects of industrial agriculture and the pesticide industry that are just, you know, uh, broad, spraying broad-based chemicals. And, and a lot of those um, chemicals are what's called neonicotinoids, or you'll hear them be referred to as neonics, and they are extremely harmful to um, all the pollinators. Um, they end up, and, uh, they have these ways of like the, transforming the DNA of the insects and and you know causing them to, to die so any plants that you're planting perennial annual or whatever wherever you're getting them always ask are they sprayed where are you getting them from where like at a nursery where do you get your stock from do you know for sure that they're um, you're growing things that are not that don't have been treated with neonicotinoids and the more that we can all share this information the more that we'll be um, really you know adding to the um, to helping the problem with the colony collapse syndromes, um, 
and the more that we're planting things and companions like this and having long time, long bloom periods. Um, another, and I, this might be a little bit off topic, I just feel really passionate about it and I think it's really important to share, um, but is, the, is uh, incorporating natives. And as a permaculturist, like I'm always trying to push things and oh, maybe we can do zone five and zone six, which I'm all for, um, especially when we're talking about things like peach trees and apricots and persimmons, um, kiwis, all of that. Um, but oftentimes uh, we can get into trouble when we're planting a lot of non-natives. Um, not, or we don't get into trouble per se, but the, um, it really does make an impact on the native pollinators. They like the natives. Um, so we might think something is pretty, but it's always a good idea to ask if it's native and maybe find its native counterpart. Um, you know, so just really good to be informed of these types of things because as we know, everything is in relationship. Um, so that's most of what I had to cover as far as um, companions and information. Are there any questions? Does, any, does everyone have a good sense of like that you're planting with your annual vegetables, what you might also plant in a companion way with it? A little bit? Not so much? In a general sense, I, I like what the, the general principles you threw out with the, the, the drawing nutrients up and, the, and the, the ones that spread out and help prevent uh, weeds from coming up because they're, they're mm -hmm. special. So that, that, that kind of stuff is really yeah. useful. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about a few more. Um, spinach is something that uh, can grow really well in the shade. So it's nice to plant under like brassicas. Um, anything that's gonna be tall, so like your kale, your cabbage, your broccoli, um, fava beans are kind of tall. Um, and lettuce also, if it's in the hot sun all day long, it's likely gonna go to seed or what we call bolting. Um, and so it's nice to, you know, plant things around things. One of the ways, you know, I'll read and read and read and read and then I'll be in my garden and I'll be like, oh, this looks really pretty together. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you just have to go with also what works for you. And um, because there are things, you know, like uh, it's nice to plant, like chervil is a really beautiful herb. Um, also anise, like, so I'm really into um, doing tea. So anything that has like a sweet or licorice-y kind of flavor, um, you know, I'll put in the, either the ends or in between my gardens and like zigzag patterns um, because they are, they're drawing the beneficials. And the leaf of the chervil is so beautiful. It's like a feathery kind of um, delicate leaf. And so I might put that like intermixed with some of my salad greens so I can snip a little bit of it as I'm making a salad. Um, you know, that's a companion too, in a way. Um, Oh, spinach, carrots like to have things. And so the general rule of thumb, so you have, I always recommend like beds that are about four or so, four to five, depending on the length of your arm, feet wide. And um, you know, and then you can have rows that are like a foot apart is the general idea about spacing. But when you start planting <laughs> things, bless you, you can plant on zigzags so you can maximize more planting within a small amount of space. So, because if you imagine everything's in a row and then, you know, your ideal spacing for your carrots is like one inch. So you go through and you're, you weed your carrots and then maybe within, so we have a foot, your carrot bed might be two rows a foot apart and then you can zigzag plantings of lettuce in between that and therefore get more lettuce in because you have more area around the base of the plant, around the whole diameter. Does that make sense? Okay. So in the same way that, um, and so you can do that with all kinds of different companions. And the other reason that that's beneficial is because if we look into nature and we say, oh, look at this tree growing here. What is the pattern that it's growing? There's a, you'll see mostly Y patterns. Um, and same with our bodies and our lungs and our um, neuro network. Everything is in a Y. And why do you think that is? Any ideas? It's so commonsensical, we don't even think of it. It's just the most efficient way to transfer water and nutrients. That's it, and it's the same way that rivers flow. So when we do that patterning in our garden, we're, um, and I actually have seen this where I've done big rows versus um, diagonal plantings, 
And it does seem, whether it's my willing it or projecting it onto it, I don't know, but it does seem like I don't have to water it as much, you know? So it's really awesome to, to be maximizing space, especially places like community gardens and patios. Um, you know, oftentimes seed companies will have more far apart spacing. And I don't think it's just because they're interested in the bottom line. I think that they, you know, we're getting to the point where in commercial growing, we're used to growing in really nutrient poor soils. And if that's the case, you need further spacing. If your soil is high in organic matter and nutrient rich, and you have things like comfrey planted around, which is one of the best dynamic accumulators for its mineral, mineral content, for phosphorus, for calcium, um, uh, iron, then um, that your soil is being restored and you can plant things closer together. Um, and yes, yeah, so I talk about yarrow, alyssum, nasturtium. Did I talk about nasturtium a little bit? It's also good for the hoverflies and the lace wings, all the, all the predatory wasps, things like praying mantises. Um, oh, borage also deters the tomato hornworm. So I think I talked about putting borage next to strawberries, but it's also a good idea to put borage next to tomatoes. And you'll even see they're so beautiful together because borage has the little five um, pointed flowers, um, as do some of the tomatoes. So they, they, they almost like look like, even though borage has pretty broad leaves, but they're pretty anyway. Um, and they're purple. And you can also, borage is known for its high omega-3s. So I've, it takes a tremendous amount of seed to grind into an oil to get the omega-3s, but you can just eat the flower heads and they'll keep flowering. That's the other thing about edible flowers. You keep picking it, you gotta eat it, it flowers more. Don't just leave the flowers, you know, work with the plants. Um, and you can also candy them with like little egg whites, little sugar, little paintbrush, and you can paint the flowers or dip them lightly and then sit them out and they'll become like a candy crystallized with decorate cakes. Another great use for borage. Um, how do you grow it? You can grow it from seed, yep. And you really just have to establish it. Well, depending on how you work your soil. So a lot of seeds, so borage is a self-seeding annual. So which just basically means that at some point you wanna stop eating the flowers. It's always hard to do, but we have to practice that as well. Let it go to seed and drop the seeds. And then you can even go through, I've been worried about this before, like you weed and work the soil and then maybe the seed won't come up, but most likely it will because a lot of seeds remain dormant in the soil. And even after maybe two or three years, it'll, they'll still keep coming up because every, even if you're, I'm, I advocate no-till gardening, but that does, but I still work like the top two to four inches of my soil um, just to create a nice seed bed. But some areas, but, but my perennial gardens, you don't really have to um, turn or till even that top layer. Um, so, so borage is a self, so you really, if you seed it, and what I would do is I'd start it from seed on your windowsill, you know, a couple six packs, and then put it out into your garden when it's like, you know, four or five inches high. And then, um, you know, and then that should be the first, only time you have to establish it, unless you want to put it in other areas. And you can gather the seed and then replant them. You know, it's so funny, I've so many times I've wanted, I've been, or there's an area that's been tilled up and I don't want grass to grow, so I'll try to seed wildflower seeds, like in the fall. And I come back and maybe there's like a couple of flowers growing and I'm like, man, it was like a ton of seed, you know, but some of the best way to do things is just to let things fall, you know, so, you know, so you can seed when, when we think about when seeds are falling on the ground, like if we want to leave our stalks and our perennial plants throughout the winter, because all those stalks are creating habitat for spiders and insects and all the things that we really want around. Um, then in the springtime, they drop their seeds. So I'm like, I'm so used to seeing the fall and they're like, okay, nope. And now I'm, and now I see the spring and like, I get like, you know, I don't know, 30 to 50% more germination with wildflower broadcasting. Anyway, just a random thing I've noticed, but so yeah, we, it's good to think about how nature would do it. And so that's a self seeding annual, yeah, borage. And it's good in flower. You can put chamomile and borage flowers in ice cube trays. If you really want to impress your friends, have a nice potluck in the garden. Put some ice cubes in some water or some, some lemon balm and some fresh squeezed lemon and it's just add some sweetness to your to your life and borage and chamomile look pretty together i think 
<laughs> Any other questions what's or? The, what are the benefits of loving? You mentioned it you didn't Um, it draw. Oh, so it's supposed to improve the flavor of different plants. Um, and it draws some beneficials, but it doesn't have a big floral bloom and if, until like the, it gets really tall. So it's a late blooming and it's a perennial food. Um, yeah, sometimes I add things to my list because they're, they're hearty, perennial, they're food. And then Lovage because of it, it has a really kind of unique and strong flavor. So it adds to the um, flavors. Um, and then, so I'll, I'll leave this, I don't, I can't remember what, what our timing was, but we could also, I'd be happy to walk around the garden and we can look at some demonstrating, like where would you, where exactly would you put these companion plants or how close to the plant can you put it? I didn't talk too much about that. Um, so, and like if I'm putting dill next to, in my brassicas, I would, you know, at least six to eight inches from the base of your plants because dill gets really big and tall and you want it to get really big and tall because it's that umbiliferous flower that you want to draw the beneficials. Um, and what else? Uh, yeah, so six to eight inches. Alyssum, nasturtium are really good for the, the ends of the beds because they kind of like to fill in. Um, and what are some of the other ones we talked about? Borage can go right intermixed in between and um, yeah, it's good to think about how big things are, are going to get. Um, and sometimes like radishes are really good things to be establishing um, now, but even earlier than now. Radishes and peas and spinach and lettuces, all of those things can germinate in colder soils. Um, so another, actually another consideration of companion planting that we didn't talk too much about, but is doing more of like succession planting. So radishes, especially daikons, are really good at breaking up hard pan soil. So, and as are carrots, but they take longer. Um, so you can establish your radishes and then come through. And once they grow up, you know, you can see your lettuce in between it. So the radish has like a, you know, it has like a couple leaves that grow off the top and then the lettuce will kind of grow in around it. And then you can harvest your salads together too, because you can chop up your radish and you put it in your greens. Um, Clover, I didn't talk too much about. That's also an incredible companion plant. Um, and there's white clover, which is usually a lower growing. And then there's the red clover. Um, and I like putting the red clover as a perennial, like at the, in the, because it's nitrogen fixing. And um, what I've done in the past with some gardens is to dig up a pathway and really seed it thickly with clover. Um, and then allow that to be your path. And then what it's doing is its roots are kind of, clover has more of a spreading root, so it can go into the sides of your beds and bring that nitrogen fixing back, symbiotic bacteria um, and be feeding your, your beds. Um, and it also brings the bees, which is lovely. Um, I had two unrelated questions that yeah. might actually bring us off track, so if you want to be sure for them, that's fine. One okay. is, where do you tend to get your seeds from? Because there are so many different types of seeds and so many different varieties. Um, and I like to get my seeds as local as possible. So I, I, and then the other yeah. unrelated question is, you mentioned no-till gardening. I was wondering if you could say anything about that. Sure. Um, so the seed question, there's some really great, there's actually a local seed company here in Heartland. Um, Sylvia Devatz is, um, does solstice seeds. And she's developing open pollinated heirloom varieties of local seed, which is really incredible. And you can find her online. I don't know if she's, she's on website. our website. So if you go to our website, the home page, the slideshow, you'll see a picture of her. If you click on the picture, it'll lead you to her catalog. Yeah. She has a deadline of June 1st. So get your order in now. <laughs> yeah. Tonight, basically go home and do your order. Yeah, because she's an incredible gardener, and we're also doing it. Chris has organized a tour of her gardens. Yes. And if in you July. really want to see some of this work in action, she's sign up for that. I have the sign up sheet here as well. Awesome. <laughs> um, so also high mowing seed is in Hardwick, Vermont, and they also do a good job with doing open. Open pollinated is generally more preferable um, than hybrid, just meaning that. You can save the seed from open pollinated seed and get true to type varieties. 
And it's open pollinated, meaning that it depends on the natural pollinators to come to pollinate it. Um, so there's a lot more to it, but that's just the general rule of thumb. And so high mowing seed, uh, Fedco is a great seed company. Um, Johnny's is fairly decent. I'm kind of going in the list of like most kind of pure yeah. and, and, and native and local to kind of like the larger ones. Um, and Pine Tree and Baker's Creek. Okay. Um, and then if you're looking for a more rare, like one of the wonderful but not local, but places to get herb stock and herb seeds is Horizon Herbs. And they're in the Pacific Northwest and they have amazing things of like artemisias and all kinds of stuff that you might want to be, inter or might be interested in planting. Um, and they do a great job. And yeah, Horizon. Territorial Seed Company also has some really unique varieties of things. Um, yeah. And then your question about no-till. So tilling is something that we do. It's an easy way of kind of getting rid of our weeds or our grasses. And on a commercial scale, it's done with tractors and tines. And what happens is those tines only go down so far in the soil. So every year when they're going down, what they're doing is they're scraping a couple feet under and they're creating uh, an impenetrable hard pan. And what happens is, so, so one of the things that plants need most of it, of like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, are like the biggest one uh, nutrients. Um, but, and then they need air and water. So if the soil is too compacted, it, it will not breathe and it cannot build organic matter. So anytime, so that's what's happened on an industrial scale. Our industrial food is coming from nutrient poor soils because the roots aren't penetrating to the subsurface layers. They're not restoring the nutrients. There's no organic matter, yada, yada, yada. On a smaller scale, if we are just, oh, I bet I only rode it till my back 40 every year or two to when I'm starting my garden. What that does is every time you turn the soil, it exposes the top layer to the elements. So sun, wind, water. And what can happen is it can kill all the microbiological life in that top layer. So when we do no-till gardening, we are building soil from the top layer up. So, and this is another thing, we are in a desperate situation on this planet with the degradation of topsoil. We don't see it necessarily here in Vermont, but on a large scale, there's a really rapid decrease in topsoil right now. And they're thinking about how to apply some of these techniques in California and other places that are kind of in extreme droughts. Um, and it's, you know, it creates dust and, and it just, there's no life to it. So by way of no-till, no what we're doing is we're adding mulch layers and compost and, um, and other layers of organic matter or uh, carbonous and or nitrogen layers. And then we build that up so that the life from the soil has more space to kind of grow and expand. Um, and that's what I recommend. Um, and there's lots of ways to do that, like what's called lasagna gardening. And so like if you're going into an area and you want to establish a new bed, um, you can put cardboard down. The, I, actually what I would I do first is get a broad fork and stick it in and aerate your soil. Cardboard or newspaper in thick mounts, um, like whole sections of newspapers overlapping at least six inches. Um, same with cardboard, you don't need that much of the cardboard as you do the new paper, but you can, that probably makes sense to you. And then overlap at least six inches and then start building your layers. So if you have grass clippings, grass clippings provide nitrogen, compost, even compost that's not fully broken down, um, straw or leaf mulch. So you can create four or five different layers. And I would do like um, cardboard, grass clippings, st um, straw, compost, maybe a leaf mulch, grass clippings, topsoil. And then so you can see all that will break down. And if you put topsoil into it, you can plant right into the top of the bed. And I've done that before very successfully, if you want to plant immediately. The other things that you can do is if you have in the springtime, you're like, okay, I got my annual vegetable plant and now I want to start building more beds, put cardboard down and just even wood chips on top. And then in the fall, you can come through and get your spade and you can poke through the, comp the cardboard and transplant things. 
So if you want to establish a berry patch or maybe a little guild with some gooseberries and some herbs, you know, dig your spade in, plant your thing, and then you have it all well mulched. Um, so yeah, but in a lot of gardens, you know, and I garden for a lot of people and I'll still turn in the top. Like if I mulch with like a spruce pine, you know, like a bark mulch in a perennial bed, the next season I'll come around, you know, with a light fork and I'll just kind of scratch the surface a little bit. Like it's nice to work it. You know, it's like blending things, you know, like if we want to make a nice smoothie, we want them to be a little blended instead of like just having them be these separate chunks. And the other thing that that does is it helps the water penetrate. But I'm still thinking about what am I adding this year to the top of this soil. And one of the other things um, you can do is plant uh, comfrey and have it on, it's a great border plant, it's great in guilds, but it does spread, if, unless you get Russian comfrey, which doesn't spread so much. Um, and you can do what's called chopping and dropping. So if you're lucky enough to find a hand sickle at like a flea market or something, and these are these tools and they come up and they have this like big arch. It's one of my favorite tools because you can just you can slash things and then drop it. So it's an easy way, it's a quick, it's efficient, and it adds nutrients and it um, is a is a it adds layers and it builds soil. Um, and just mulch with that around fruit trees, around berry bushes, right in your garden bed. Um, you know, and it, it, it might look a little funky, but it's it really does the trick. So, and if you ever want, finding comfrey can be really easy. You can just, you know, a lot of people that have comfrey are often willing to divide it and, and because it, it spreads. So it's a good one. I have, those are great questions. Thank you. Sure. We've talked about a lot of nitrogen fixers. What are nitrogen lovers that would go, like, what are plants that need a lot? Um, tomatoes and corn, primarily, are the are the biggest or heavy feeders. Um, what other heavy nitrogen feeders? Brassicas. Hops are, okay. Yeah, brassicas like nitrogen. Yep. Um, Squash benefit from, from the healthy Compost, goes. yep. Yeah, so that's probably, again, a list in like the most need to the le least need mm -hmm. for that. Um, plants. Yeah, tomatoes. Anytime you see yellowing around the leaf, that's generally a nitrogen deficiency. So you can top feed with compost. Like if you don't, if you haven't yet established all your perfect guild species, which razor? <laughs> I'd love to meet someone that has, but it's an evolving process, so it's never, I'm, I mean, that's kind of a joke because it never really is there, but. You're always building into it. Um, but, you know, top dressing is a great way, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So you get some compost and you can just put it around the base of your plant and allow the water to, to build into it instead of turning it in, right? So that's what we would do for no-till. And you can just top dress. Any other questions? Is anyone interested in walking around and looking at a couple of the plots and talking about what might be planted there? Yeah. Let's go to the garden.